Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Freddy Garcia. Today, we're joined by the always amazing Dr. Nate Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser, how are you doing today? Awesome, man. Glad to be back. How are you? I'm, I'm fantastic. Today, we're shooting a quick video on three key concepts you need to know for understanding dysautonomias. Uh, let's get right into it. Let's get learning. Yeah, so we basically pulled these from, I've since we kind of started teaching this course, I've got to have so much like fun feedback from, from diplomates I haven't talked to in a while. You just kind of lose touch. So um, we, we picked out three main concepts that people have really commented that they've really enjoyed or that we're able to use and kind of like change the way they thought about things. So we picked these three um, because they keep sticking out in those conversations. So I don't know, you want to just roll right yeah. into it? Let's share them. Let's, let's teach everybody. <laughs> All right. So number one thing is uh, updating the idea of fight or flight versus rest and digest. So as everybody knows, and obviously this video is going to be available to uh, like a swath of people, but if you were to search autonomic systems on Google, you're going to come up with just gobs of articles and websites and everything that is going to describe autonomic systems as the sympathetic system does fight or flight things and the parasympathetic system does rest and digest things. And that is brilliant from like a, like a popular science. If I'm going to try to communicate like a simple concept around these systems, great. But in terms of autonomic dysfunction, dysautonomia, things that we're trying to, to really hone in and help people with, not an adequate description. So like, number one, we have to think about the fact that um, whether, let's back up. So the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system were named a hundred years ago. And they were named based on kind of like three features. Number one was just on how their peripheral nerves were organized. So parasympathetic nerves had acetylcholine, acetylcholine receptors. So like acetylcholine to the ganglia, acetylcholine after the ganglia, the ganglia tend to be further away from the spinal cord, right? That's what makes them parasympathetic. Sympathetic nerves have their ganglion either paraspinally or in, in front of the spine, right? And then they have long projections to whatever the organ they're going to is, and they use norepinephrine, right? That is how they became named. It wasn't based on function. And that part's really important because the reality is each one of these pathways, even if it's a different parasympathetic pathway or a different sympathetic pathway, they're functionally specific. They meaning I have specific nerves that come from my brainstem that are gonna go stimulate my heart to slow it down. That's, there's a parasympathetic version of that. But on the same side, uh, I can have a specific nerve that's gonna go to my salivary gland and they may not be connected, right? So they each have their own job. And that part's really, really important. Same thing when we think about the sympathetic system. Very frequently, you will hear people describe their sympathetic system is in overdrive or their fight or flight is in overdrive or something like, have you heard things like that before, Freddie? Of course. Yeah, so the same thing applies where we have to modulate, like blood pressure, for example, is mostly modulated through muscle sympathetic nerve activity. And that allows us to be able to take this one organ, which is basically like the peripheral vascular system that goes through the muscles and be able to send that sympathetic fiber to all of them. It's functionally specific. It constricts the blood vessel, right? It goes to one organ system. It just goes everywhere because it's a big organ, right? Um, and that allows us to be able to constrict it, create increase of blood pressure, and then we get to have uh, a big party for that. The second thing that always comes up is this idea of paired antagonism. Have you ever heard of that concept? I, I have, but I would like to hear your, you, you explain that again. Thank you. Um, so paired antagonism is basically just this idea that you have, um, remember we kind of drew it on a seesaw where we've got the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system. And if one goes up, the other goes down. And if one goes up, the other goes down and they work in, in opposition or antagonistically like that. And it, it's just not the case. So if we go back to 
if we go back to the, the muscle sympathetic nerve activity, right? And we said that if we want to influence blood pressure, the way we can do that is to constrict peripheral vessels by increasing sympathetic drive to muscles. What's interesting is the sympathetic drive to the cutaneous system, like to your skin, that would be more for thermal regulation to either kind of make you sweat to blow off some heat or to make you pull blood away from your skin to keep some heat in. It's not really linked to the muscle sympathetic nerve activity, right? So you would say pretty commonly in this idea of paired antagonism that you would think that the sympathetic system would constrict vasculature and then what would dilate it would be the parasympathetic system, right? It happens in the pupil and that's kind of the only spot, but it's to two different types of muscles. They both just happen to act in that one system. The reality is in the periphery, as far as blood vessels go, there's zero parasympathetic innervation, none at all, right? It's all sympathetic innervation. So this idea that we have one that goes up and one that goes down is false. And it's a really big deal. And we get a lot of great feedback on it. Um, because there are treatment protocols and algorithms that are kind of designed around, like if you've got, you know, a high heart rate, we do all vagal stimulation or we do, you know, like auricular vagal stimulation. And some of those things work and they're great. And it's a different conversation, but it's more around the idea that we want to make sure that the system that we're going to target and use therapeutically makes sense for the thing that's failing that particular person. So that has been um, a really big uh, kind of addition to our conversations and, and something we've gone pretty deep in. And then the last part is that the naming is based on the anatomy, not the function. That's kind of what I talked about from the beginning that to divide it up and say sympathetic versus parasympathetic is only useful from an anatomical perspective. As far as thinking about function, we wanna think about it way more specific than that. We could think about in the motor system, right? If I tap someone's patellar reflex, that reflex takes a sensory drive from the patella, comes up into my lumbar spine, connects with an inner neuron, right? We've got some inhibition at the cord level. And then depending on that level of inhibition, I'm going to get a response as a knee jerk response. If I'm not getting a ton of inhibition into the cord, that knee jerk response will be big. If I have a peripheral nerve injury, the knee jerk response will be small, right? So we wouldn't, we wouldn't look at that scenario and say that anytime I move my knee or I tap a tendon in my knee, because that is a motor system, a skeletal motor system, that I would expect my arm to do the same thing at the same time, right? So if we activate an autonomic reflex, we wouldn't necessarily expect all autonomic reflexes to follow suit. What makes our brain and our nervous system and our body brilliant is the fact that we can separate them. So I think that those, those three portions of that are, are super helpful in that sense. Okay, should we do the second one? Let's do it. Can I ask you another, can I ask you a question while you got this slide up there? Ooh, I like this next slide. Now you already got me curious for the next one. You know, like this uh, dichotomy of fight or flight or rest and digest, but even if, even rest and digest, can I ask you, and I'm sure you, you've you covered this, but uh, since I have an expert with me, I'll ask, uh, can you do digestion well while also resting? Like to me, I, I look at that and I go, uh, you know, they put rest and digest in one in one little bowl, but I go, can you actually rest well when you need to digest or do you affect digestion if you're trying to rest, even though they're yeah. both, you know, in the parasympathetic umbrella. And the reason I ask is because I track my own autonomic data and I could tell you, you know, during my heart rate and HRV and things at night, if I eat too late tonight, it actually affects my ability to rest. So I kind of go, I, I, I see what you're speaking to here because yep. sometimes the oversimplification is easy for understanding uh, the general topic, but then when you get into the nitty gritty of it, you kind of go, well, it's actually a little more complex than that. Yeah, and in ex I think that's exactly the way to put it is, is when you wanna like do something and manipulate it more, the, the generalized definition doesn't really help, 
anymore. And uh, yeah, exactly what you're talking about and, and uh, to name names, but Whoop has really popularized that concept around like, let's really pay attention to our meal timing at night because it seems to really affect HRV when you're sleeping. And it's brilliant. And you realize that like digestion is its own, its own functional beast, right? It happens within its own sensory criteria, within, within its own motor capacitance, within context. So I think those three components really matter. That's a really good observation. Yeah, cool. So I'm not going crazy, but excellent. All right. Thank you. That's a great observation. I love that one. So the next question we had is, is a high heart rate. So in the autonomic world, a high heart rate is a, is a big signal in that world, right? And we're saying like our heart rate is too high. People notice this. Um, and we want to understand like, is that, is that a, the thing? Is that the thing that is failing or is that a compensation or both? And that part's super important because we want to make sure that we are not assuming either one. We are not assuming that a high heart rate is always where the heart rate is the pathology because sometimes it is the pathology, but sometimes it's just the compensation for another pathology. So sometimes we want to do the thing that is, we want to treat the thing that is affecting the high heart rate. And sometimes we want to treat the thing that is causing a compensation. So an example of that would be, um, so if you just think about, as we all know, the heart rate has its own intrinsic, or the heart has its own intrinsic rate. So if you let the SA node fly and do its own thing, it wants to be somewhere between like 100 and 120, right? But then we have this beautiful system from the brainstem that generates a signal, right, from the nucleus ambiguous and that nucleus ambiguous in the brainstem comes down with the cardio inhibitory thing barrage to the SA node and just says, hey let's just tone her down a bit and it holds that baseline steady rate and it's just going to do that most of the time now things would, that would cause that heart rate to to escape on its own might be something that would affect output at the nucleus ambiguous right in this sense we would want to treat the thing that is causing the heart rate to fail. In other words, we're, we're losing cardio inhibition, right? So we want to treat that. But a lot of times we might see that a high heart rate is a compensation for not having enough peripheral vasoconstriction or not being able to manage our blood pressure or having a head injury and having impaired cerebral autoregulation and becoming pressure passive. And if we become pressure passive, then we don't do a very good job of sustaining blood flow to the head. So we have to have a heart rate to keep up. So in some of these instances, we look at as a heart rate as that is a marker of something that's failed in the nervous system. In other instances, we may look at it as that heart rate is doing a beautiful job in compensating part of the cardiovascular system that's not working well. Um, so I love that part because that really opens us up to be able to understand like, wow, there's a lot of nuance to treating something like um, an inappropriate sinus tachycardia or a POTS or a case of um, like hypocapnia that's causing hyperventilation, right? Or hyperventilatory hypercapnia that's gonna cause the same sort of problems. So we look at all these different nuances and it helps us to break them apart. And we realize like, if you're going to have a POTS protocol, it better have a whole bunch of pieces to it because there's a lot of pathology that can be there. Or if you're going to have, if you're going to be, you know, the, the orthostatic hypotension person, there's a whole lot of variability that can be there. So being able to kind of look at all these out and, and parse them through has, has been super fun and such good feedback from, from our good friends in the program. It's been great. Cool. You want to do the next one here? Yeah, let's go. I'm ready. All right. So the last part is that the longitudinal level of the lesion still applies. Are we still, is this still a common vernacular? Am I dating myself? Yeah. You know, you know I was going to say for the people who haven't heard that term, you have to break that down. You know, now we actually use, you're hearing this term more than the, uh, the level of decompensation. Yeah. Is what you, you, you hear in the literature as well. So a term, but it, they essentially mean the, the same thing kind of, you mm -hmm. know, so 
Uh, yeah, but could you break that down for people who are maybe hearing this for the first time? I was hoping that'd be the case. Yeah, so the longitudinal level of lesion is this kind of way that we systematically approach finding where in the neuraxis the problem occurs. Is it at the receptor, the peripheral nerve, spinal cord, brainstem, cerebellum, limbic cortex, cerebral cortex, away you go, right? So this helps us to understand how this all works. We went, we kind of talked about earlier the concept of a patellar reflex. And if you've got a problem in a receptor where that signal can't come up to the cord, you're not gonna get a reflex because the signal never got through. Or if you're having problems with the anterior horn, the signal may come through, but you're not gonna get a motor response because there's no motor response to be had. And if you've got a brain injury, you're not gonna be able to inhibit the inner neuron and we're gonna see an exaggeration of cord responses, right? So really simple way to think about that. A lot of times when we look at the autonomic system and again, in like a pop cultural sense or like a simplified sense is that um, it's largely reflexive and then we see it's largely limbic. So people are either anxious or we're thinking about it in terms of reflexes. And what's beautiful about this system is it works the same way we would think about the rest of the motor system. Um, so the same way you could have hypokinetic responses or hyperkinetic responses, you can have dyskinetic responses, you can have dysmetria, all of these different components of how accurate something is, if it's working too much or too little, if it's um, got a longer latency or not able to activate it to the same degree, all the same stuff that we would think about with motor systems, with movement disorders, they apply when we think about autonomic syndromes, which is brilliant because it gives us a framework to operate within. So we can say the same way we would look at our patellar response, can we look at cardiovascular responses the same way? Can we look at thermoregulatory responses the same way, right? So if I feel something that is cold, do I have the normal response where I get constriction of the blood vessels in my skin and the skin gets cold, gets a little drier, right? So we can measure all these things the same way we can measure motor responses, which is fantastic because if you can measure it, you can do something, see if it changes and then do that again and see if it changes and do it again and see if it changes. And it gives us this, this beautiful way to be able to, to measure the effects that we're having in the nervous system. So um, those are like our three like kind of tips, kind of like dispelling a little bit of myths, but they're the things that people have been really talking or like reaching out and talking about. So I appreciate that. So this is me just reflecting back how awesome uh, our group has been in, in contributing. So. Thanks. And I got to say, we're hearing obviously the same things. We communicate with our scholars every day. The, co the course is being amazingly received. Everybody's very, very happy and they're becoming better clinicians, which is what we want to do. We want to attract amazing talent such as yourself to put on amazing educational programs so we could serve patients at higher levels. And that's what the Care Kids Institute is committed to. So I'll, I'm going to continue to applaud you for your, your work and efforts in this coursework. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Yeah, thank you. It's been a lot of fun. We've got some some old friends and some some really like the best of the best folks in our field have been there, which is pretty fun to see. And uh, so I'm having just a blast doing it with them. So, yeah. um, and those of you that haven't come, come on. Yeah. Well, so, so that's what I'm about to say. Hey, to everybody who's watching this video and saying, hey, you know what? I want to come study with uh, Dr. Kaiser and the Carrick Institute. Uh, the courses, we're, you know, we're recording them and we're literally putting them as quickly as we can into our online learner platform. We have a pretty sophisticated platform with uh, which is going to give you the videos, a flipped classroom, uh, quizzing and uh, knowledge check questions. I mean, it's, it's, it's really an amazing platform for learning and and not just, you know, give you a video and say, hey, watch this and good luck learning. Or like we're literally taking steps to make sure that you actually grasp through the material. Um, and you can tell just because you're watching this video, like obviously Dr. Kaiser wants to share something and say, hey, I really want to, I want, I want to educate people, uh, which is why Dr. Kaiser is, is one of our esteemed uh, faculty. I mean, we, we get doctors and teachers and professors that actually care about making better clinicians. So, I mean, this kind of speaks, to me, this speaks values and hopefully they recognize that. So if you want to join in on this uh, fun, uh, go to karakitsu.com and uh, join us digitally and hopefully you can kind of catch up 
uh, to the coursework really quick and catch us at a live class uh, before before to only live in digital. But well, you know what? I have a feeling we'll be doing this every couple of years anyways, because uh, like everything else, the neuroscience keeps advancing, which means that we all have to keep advancing, don't we? Don't we, Nate? Every year, every year. I know, every year. it doesn't great. stop, it doesn't stop. But Dr. Kaiser, Building thank the plane you so as you fly. <laughs> That's right. Thank you very much for your time today. We, uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this video. And again, if you wanna join us in the program, go to karakitsu.com. Dr. Kaiser, we'll catch you next time. Everybody else, have a great rest of your day. All right. Take care, everybody.